a foodie, visiting Bologna and the region of Emilia-Romagna is an absolute delight for anyone who loves good food. With a variety of succulent rich dishes, this is how Bologna earned the nickname La Grassa, the fat. Trying all the best food this region is famous for is definitely one of the best ways to enjoy, explore and experience Bologna and beyond. Speaking of which, to visit the region like a local, I joined the Untold Italy Beyond Bologna tour, where our fantastic local guide took me and a small group of 10 guests to some pretty amazing places. We visited a Parmigiano Reggiano dairy to see this iconic cheese being made first thing in the morning, enjoyed an exclusive balsamic vinegar tasting and tour at the Museum of Balsamic Vinegar, and walked among hundreds of thousands of euros worth of prosciutto, also located in the hilltop prosciutteria, and tried our hand at making some of the region's favorite pasta, tortelloni and tortellini, in a private workshop. But food wasn't the only thing on the menu. We learned about Bologna, Parma and Modena as part of a walking tour in each city. And to top it all off, ate in some of the best off the beaten track restaurants and little known locations. To find out more about this Beyond Bologna tour and others available with Untold Italy, just click on the link in the description below this video. In the meantime, let me show you why this tour is da fare, a must do. Andiamo! From homemade pasta to mouth-watering cured meats, Food is taken really seriously around here. Many recipes are even registered at the local Chamber of Commerce to preserve their authenticity. So here's your guide on what to eat in Bologna and beyond to satisfy those taste buds and make the most of your experience here. The first day of our tour starts in the capital of Emilia-Romagna, Bologna. The terracotta-hued capital is famously nicknamed La Dotta for the learned, La Grassa, the fat, and La Rossa, the red. In the morning, our group meets for the first time and we meet our tour leader, Giulia. Soon after, we meet Stella, a local Bolognese tour guide who shows us around Bologna city centre as part of a three-hour food walking tour. As we snake our way through the pretty porticos, we stop at various key locations. Located in Piazza del Nettuno, next to Piazza Maggiore, we visit the Fountain of Neptune, a 16th century masterpiece sculpted by Gian Bologna. It was commissioned by Pope Pius IV and symbolizes the city's maritime history and represents its political and artistic prominence during the Renaissance. Bologna is famous for its porticos, which date back to medieval times. They are a distinctive architectural feature of this city that is home to 38 kilometers of covered walkways. Initially built as a practical solution to expand living spaces above narrow streets, the porticos gradually became a defining element of Bologna's urban landscape. They provided shelter from weather conditions and allowed for social interactions, trade and commerce to flourish. The construction of porticos was encouraged and regulated by laws and regulations enacted by the local government. Today, Bologna's porticos remained a cherished symbol of the city and are recognised as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. History lessons are punctuated with various food tastings on this tour. Our first food stop is in our Osteria, an inn or a tavern, where we sit down for a spread of cured meats, including mortadella, sometimes called bologna, salame rosa, and prosciutto di parma, which we eat with crescenta, a delicious focaccia type bread that's cut into squares. Mortadella holds a special place in the hearts of Italians, especially in Bologna and Emilia Romagna, where it's considered a true culinary treasure. Imagine a delicious blend of finely ground pork, dotted with tasty bits of fat, remember la grassa, and infused with the tempting aromas of black pepper and bright swells of pistacchio or pistachios, pure deliciousness. This beloved meat can be traced all the way back to Roman times, with its name coming from the word morta, used to grind pork and spices at the time something you can see for yourself at the city's archaeological museum. The first official recipe didn't appear until the 17th century when Cardinal Farnese established its distinctiveness through standardized production techniques comparable to today's PDO and PGI designations. Mortadella is sometimes referred to as Bologna, but this is a term specifically used to refer to Mortadella di Bologna IGP, which is produced according to strict production specifications. We wash it all down with Pignoletto, a sparkling white wine from the Emilia-Romagna region. It's famous for its crisp, refreshing character that offers vibrant flavours of citrus, apple and floral notes. 
Till 10 years ago, it was only a DOC dog. Why? Because we didn't have a charm called the Pignoletto. You know, to be DOC G, that G stands for geographical. Okay? It needs to indicate a specific area. <laughs> And it's a white grape, typical of the hills around Bologna. This white grape grows on the hills surrounding the city and creates a sparkling wine that mingles Prosecco's vibrant charm with Chardonnay's sophistication. It's so good that Pignoletto dei Colli Bolognesi is the sole DOCG wine in the Emilia Romagna region. The Pignoletto vine has a rich history, with its roots reaching back to the days of the ancient Romans. In his well known work Naturalis Historia, it is believed that Pliny the Elder referred to this grape as Pino Lieto. However, he wasn't particularly fond of the wine that it produced, as it lacked the sweetness that the Romans adored so much. Thoroughly satisfied but excited to try more food, we continue our historical exploration of the city. As we pass by the city's two iconic medieval leaning towers, Stella tells us that the official recipe dictates that the width of Tagliatelle should be 1 12,270th of the height of the city's Azinelli Tower when cooked, or 8mm. This fun fact soon becomes a theme of the tour, where there is a story and reason for everything here. Coincidentally, Tagliatelle al Ragù is next on the menu. Stopping by a famous local market, we enjoy our first taste of this classic Italian dish, consisting of long ribbon-like pasta served with a rich, slow-cooked meat sauce. A telltale sign that you're eating an authentic ragù is when it's orange in colour and there is no visible trace of tomato. A highlight of Bologna, tagliatelle are delicate golden ribbons of egg-based pasta, traditionally hand-rolled to produce a richly textured surface that tenderly embraces sauces. These captivating strands were originally created by Mastro Zaffirano for Lucrezia Borgia's wedding in 1487, taking inspiration from the bride's gorgeous blonde locks. The term tagliatelle stems from tagliare, which means to cut in Italian, because their preparation involves rolling out the dough and slicing it into graceful strips. A golden tagliatelle replica can even be found on display at the Chamber of Commerce in Bologna. Tagliatelle's true magic is revealed when paired with Bologna's signature ragù. In other words, we call it Bolognese sauce overseas. Now, this recipe has been preserved at the Bologna Chamber of Commerce since 1982. Now, if you have a sweet tooth, this is a must-try food. It's torta di riso, or rice cake. Now, this is Bologna's classic dessert. The time-honored recipe, recorded at Bologna's Chamber of Commerce, of course, combines simple everyday ingredients such as rice, eggs, sugar, and milk. The outcome is an incredibly smooth and velvety treat that dissolves on your tongue, exuding a rich vanilla scent and with an irresistible, delightful flavor. Originating in the early 15th century, this dessert was first created in Bologna during the Corpus Domini celebrations in late May, when vibrant fabrics adorned balconies and windows, and the dessert, sliced into diamond-shaped pieces, was shared among family and friends. As a result, torta di riso, also called torta degli adobbi, meaning cake of decorations, can nowadays be found easily in all of Bologna's traditional bakeries. After our tour in the afternoon, we're whisked away to the countryside to our home for the next three nights in an agriturismo, a farm stay that's nestled amidst rolling green hills and vineyards. Each room has a private terrace that overlooks the estate and is named after a product that they produce on site. I'm staying in the grappa room. After some downtime by the pool, it's time for an aperitivo. 
In the early evening, we meet at reception and sink into the cozy couches in the foyer for a Lambrusco spritz that teases our taste buds once again, ahead of our first three-course meal together. With wines from the Terre di Castelli region that's located between the plains and the Apennines in the province of Modena, each dish is perfectly paired thanks to the recommendations of our waiter, who insists I try three different types of Lambrusco. Starting with an amuse bouche with morte de la mousse and lemon, we move on to lightly fried gnocco fritto with parmigiano reggiano. For my main, I opt for the vegetarian ravioli, while jealously eyeing off the tortellini in brodo, or tortellini in broth, that someone else next to me orders. A perfect end to a perfect first day comes when dessert is served. A generous portion of gelato is placed in front of me as I watch the waiter drizzle aceto balsamico tradizionale di Modena over it. After a blissful sleep in my huge king-size bed, I wake up with the sun and its golden light hitting the surrounding valley and rolling vineyards right outside my window. Of all the days of this trip, today is the one I'm excited about the most. When you think of Italy, one iconic product, besides pasta, surely comes to mind, and that is Parmigiano Reggiano, without a doubt my favourite cheese. I put it on everything, and today we're going to see how it's made. Outside of Italy, we call it Parmesan cheese, or Parmesan. But as our guide Giulia reminds us, it's not correct, it's called Parmigiano Reggiano. Not wanting to spoil my appetite for the tastings later on, I have a light breakfast with eggs and freshly made ginger, carrot and celery juice. This is my heart. This is my region Emilia Romagna, okay? Now, as you can see, we mentioned the very famous Via Emilia, where all the provinces of our region, my region, are. So we start from Piacenza, that's where John is from. Okay, so Johnny comes from here. Then you have Parma, Reggio, Modena, Bologna, Forli Cesena, Ravenna, Rimini. And Ferrara is here. So this morning we are going to the mountains to a very special dairy farm, very, very tiny. They make only eight wheels of Parmigiano Reggiano every day. Normally, dairy farms make, I don't know, 50, 30. They could make also 100, but we are special. We want the tiny one, the little secret. Are we ready? Insisting that we arrive early so we can see how each Parmigiano Reggiano wheel is created, Julia rounds us up into our luxury tour bus once again. I'm the first to climb aboard as I'm eager to visit this little dairy that was featured in Stanley Tucci's series Searching for Italy. As we climb the winding roads that lead up to the Casificio, we head into the fog that hides the valley below. When we arrive, we put on a fluttering blue mesh smock with matching hairnet and shoe covers before being led into a large room with several large copper vats. The cheesemakers are already busy gathering and transporting large white balls, which is the result of rennet and a whey starter undergoing a natural coagulation process from milk collected the night before. curd that they are now cutting in half 
and separate it into the two wings of Parmigiano Reggiano. Remarkably, approximately 550 litres of milk are required to create each wheel of Parmigiano Reggiano. From the curd forming to each mould being filled and covered with a special linen cloth, we get to watch the whole process. Parmigiano Reggiano has a rich history dating back to the Middle Ages when the first dairy farms were created in the monasteries around the area, taking advantage of the abundance of watercourses and large pastures. Here's a fun fact. Parmigiano Reggiano is so precious that it has its very own cheese bank in Italy. The regional Credito Emiliano Credem has been accepting wheels of Parmigiano Reggiano as collateral for loans since the 1950s. This bank has a special warehouse where the cheese is stored and a dedicated team takes care of it from the moment it arrives until the moment it's returned to the farmer. So next time you enjoy a bite of Parmigiano Reggiano, remember that it's not just a culinary treasure you're eating, but also a unique financial asset. one by one by a third party, an expert that comes to the dairy farm after 12 months and with a hammer, he beats the cheese. Is it a good sound? Yes, you get the mark. Are there air bubbles? Sorry, you are not excellent. You are not perfect. You are almost, but you are not Parmesan Reggiano. So boom, you are off. They will scrape this and it's not going to have the mark. Next we wander around the salting bars and visit the huge aging room that's filled floor to ceiling with hundreds of thousands of euros worth of Parmigiano Reggiano cheese wheels. Almost they she had her firstborn, and even the cheese master of the time had the firstborn. So they made a challenge. They said, "We are gonna have a cheese a cheese wheel that we will use as birthday cake in ten years, so we can compare the aging of our son to the aging of Parmigiano Reggiano wheel." So look in. 2013 in October, so it means October this 2023, year October. this year in October, I told Daniela that I want to go to that birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> because they will open this wheel oh. and see what a 10-year-old Parmigiano Reggiano is like. And you see, it's still edible. We end our visit with an hour-long tasting that includes all other cheeses produced on site, including both soft and hard cheeses. The highlight for me is trying the different stages of aging of Parmigiano Reggiano, from 24 months all the way up to 40 months. Following our dairy adventure, we visit the nearby Chestnut Museum for a light lunch where we learn about Borlenghi, Chachi and Tigelle. These three breads are prepared using basic ingredients that were originally eaten by less privileged mountain dwellers. Vi faccio vedere un po' quelli, come si fa a preparare la crescentina alla vera e propria. Allora, chiaramente gli ingredienti, come abbiamo detto, sono farina, sale, acqua eh, e olio. So what is called tigella and here is the confusion tigella is actually the stone that was used to cook the crescentina how would they do it they would place this this inside the fireplace when this this were hot enough they would put one disc one bread one disc one bread one disc one bread after a demonstration, we get to try our own hand at making a borlengo, a thin, crispy flatbread. It looks easier to make it than it is. Mm -hmm. 
leaving it up to the experts, together we sit down at a long table choosing from various cured meats and cheeses to pair with each of these three mountain breads. Buon appetito! After lunch we make an unscheduled stop to take a stroll around Sassi di Rocca Malatina, located in the hills of the medieval Molinese Apennines. The area covers 2,300 hectares and is made up of ancient chestnut groves, woods and cultivated fields. Its centerpiece is the huge sandstone spires of the Sassi which rise up from the deep valley floor. In the afternoon we head back to the Agriturismo where we unwind and recharge for a few hours before heading back out again for a surprise stop. That I won't spoil you with the details. Dinner is served in the quaint town of Castelvetro di Modena. With the sun still shining we enjoy an aperitivo all'aperto outside before heading indoors just after sunset where dinner is served by our bubbly waiter from Calabria who recommends various dishes according to our tastes. I order the tagliatelle ai funghi or tagliatelle with mushrooms which is both flavorful and filling. For dessert we're spoiled for choice so we order everything on the menu so we can try each one. Our day starts in the picturesque town of Spilimberto. Off the beaten tourist path, this charming commune is where we venture into the world of black gold, that is, traditional balsamic vinegar from Modena. Aceto balsamico, a culinary treasure from the Emilia Romagna region, is steeped in rich history and a painstakingly detailed production process. There are two primary varieties. Aceto Balsamico di Modena IGP and Aceto Balsamico Tradizionale di Modena POD. These adhere to strict regulations to preserve their authenticity. IGP is crafted by blending wine vinegar, aged for at least 10 years, with carefully chosen grape musts from Modena and the Reggio Emilia provinces, and must be aged for no less than two months. In contrast, POD exclusively uses must from select grapes grown in the modern province, with a minimum aging period of 12 years. As a rule of thumb, the longer the aging, the finer the quality. With roots dating back to ancient Rome, the term balsamic first appeared in the Duke Estes Salad Inventory in 1747 and alluded to its medicinal qualities, as it was commonly used as a remedy at the time. The prestige of this exceptional condiment was further solidified after the establishment of the Kingdom of Italy, as it gained recognition at international exhibitions and became a sought-after delicacy around the world. To learn more about the production process, we visit the Consortium of Traditional Balsamic Vinegar. As we're led into each of the museum's rooms, we learn about each step of the production process. We learn that the key difference between vinegar and balsamic vinegar lies in the ingredients. Vinegar is made from wine, while balsamic vinegar is derived from grape must. There are three crucial factors that contribute to the production of balsamic vinegar. The quality of the grapes, the composition of the vineyard, and the exceptionally slow process of preparing and transforming the grape must. To produce traditional balsamic vinegar, aceto balsamico tradizionale, only specific grape varieties are chosen. The process begins with the pressing of grapes in vinification vats. Within 24 hours, the grape must is strained and then simmered over a low flame until its volume is reduced by half. Now if we want to check the temperature, we use a thermometer. In the past, they used walnuts. Walnuts float on the surface of the liquid. If they move around, it means that the temperature is right. If they spin too quickly, it means that you have to lower the fire. Because if the fire is too high, you burn the sugar, giving a bitter flavor <coughs> to the grape must that year after year, concentration after concentration, it becomes, it gives a bit of vinegar, and this is not what we want. Afterwards, it is cooled and transferred to small untreated wooden barrels. These barrels are only filled up to 70% of their capacity with grape must. Over the course of a year, the must is transferred to smaller barrels, repeating this process annually. With a minimum of five barrels in the series, each barrel is unique, made from various types of wood and varying in sizes, to facilitate the slow acidification process. The more barrels in the series, the more complex the taste. Traditionally, the barrels used for the gradual fermentation and concentration of the vinegar are stored in cool attics during winter to endure the intense heat of summer, contributing to the vinegar's distinctive flavour profile. <music> 
Thanks to Julia's brilliant idea of getting some extra Parmigiano Reggiano from the previous day's visit to the dairy, our private balsamic tasting at the consortium is the highlight of my day. We sampled both a 12-year balsamic vinegar and the Extra Vecchio Extra Old, which takes a minimum of 24 years to age. Both are deliciously decadent and smooth. After picking up a bottle in the gift shop, we're off to Modena for the afternoon. Here we embark on a captivating tour with Loredana. Modena was much more older. It was founded by the Romans more or less 200 years before Christ. Along this long, long, long street, Via Emilia. This one, oh. Via Emilia. Yeah, do you know the man who built the street? Marco Emilio Lepido. So the name of the region, of part of the region, and the name of the street are after that Roman man, Consul man, that was here in the period when, yes, when the Romans were conquering this area. She takes us to see the Luciano Pavarotti Opera House, named after Pavarotti, who performed here in front of his home audience, and where a bronze statue stands today to commemorate him. From here we head to the beautiful Baroque Palazzo Ducale of Modena. From 1452 to 1859 it served as the official residence of the esteemed Este Dukes of Modena. Today it's home to the prestigious Italian Military Academy. Passing through Piazza Grande, we see the Modena Cathedral, the Duomo di Modena, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and see the iconic medieval Ghirlandina Tower. Renowned for its elegant design and height, it offers panoramic views of the city. Our tour culminates with lunch at the city's oldest indoor market, located in the heart of the city. We welcome the shade from the warm afternoon sun and sit down to a market fresh lunch. Not wanting to spoil my appetite for tonight's workshop, I order a crisp salad with apple, walnuts and raisins and nibble on an assortment of fried vegetables. Before the evening descends, we set out to a magnificent agriturismo and acetaya, a balsamic vinegar producer, for another gastronomic adventure. Together we uncover the secrets of crafting the iconic pasta of this region, tortellini. After we wrap ourselves in an apron, we stand in front of our workstations and follow Maria's instructions. She expertly demonstrates how to make the perfect tortelloni and tortellini. Who knew making pasta required so much arm strength? After lots of kneading, giggles and pin rolling, we finally get to see our pasta take shape as we try to figure out the best portion of stuffing to place inside each pasta square and how to wrap it around our thumb and index finger to create the perfect shape. As Maria explains, according to legend, Tortellini was inspired by the navel of Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. Despite uncertainty over the origin, the oldest known tortellini recipe dates all the way back to the 14th century and is kept safe in a cookbook preserved at the University Library of Bologna. Tortellini are a handmade delicacy crafted by local ladies called svoljine, from the word svoglia, which means pasta dough. These skilled artisans have been passing down the art of making tortellini for generations, making it a true craft that can still be observed around town. The traditional way to eat tortellini is in brodo, with a simple broth. They can also be served with a delicate sauce. Raising a toast to the setting sun, we explore the grounds in the balsamic vinegar cellar on site, while the chefs pick out our best homemade tortellini and tortelloni to cook for our dinner.
Just after sunset, we sit down and compare our odd-shaped tortellini with those of the on-site chef. While ours are a bit tough, those of our chef are tender and perfectly proportioned. And of course, I had to end the day with another gelato with aceto balsamico tradizionale on top. Bidding farewell to our countryside agriturismo, we begin our day at Castello di Torre Chiara, where we're joined by our local guide, Giacomo, who leads us up to the castle via a winding green footpath. So, for example, this is Elytrisium. It looks like rosemary, but it's not a rosemary. Uh, if you want to smell, this is used also in perfumery because the essential oil have a, partic- have a particular essence. If you want to try, Giacomo explains that this 15th century castle was built by Pier Maria Rossi, a nobleman who was deeply in love with his mistress, Bianca Pellegrini. Perched atop a hill, the castle offers breathtaking panoramic views of the picturesque countryside and remains a testament to Pierre's and Bianca's enduring romance. From here we head up into the hills to visit a local prosciutto producer. As we enter the factory to see the production line, Giacomo points out the large windows that are open, explaining that the fresh mountain air is a key ingredient in how prosciutto gains its unique flavour. Prosciutto crudo di Parma stands out among the region's specialties for its distinctive sweet and savoury notes. This delicious ham hails from Parma, about an hour from Bologna, home to the perfect climate for crafting this irresistible texture and taste. The word prosciutto, meaning dried up, hints at the meticulous process. After salting, each ham is air dried before being left to age for a minimum of 12 months. Prosciutto di Parma has roots in the Roman times when Parma locals excelled at making salted hams from their large herds of pig. But it wasn't until the Prime Minister of the Duchy of Parma planned to construct two pig slaughterhouses that the Parma ham industry boomed. Since 1996, Prosciutto di Parma has obtained the protected designation of origin PDO recognition and is controlled by a strict production specification, which is an absolute guarantee of quality. And every year in September, a festival is held in the province of Parma to celebrate Parma ham. This can imitate the movement of human hands, uh, so make a massage. Eh? It was very important starting everything with a massage. Uh, because thanks to this massage, uh, you can also squeeze uh, the last drop of blood that can remain in the main veins. And this is important also for the meat. Uh, the main characteristics of Parma ham is having uh, a soft meat with a sweet taste and so on. Uh, so this massage can help also the absorption of the salt uh, because they use this machine for more than one time. Uh, so, and after this, the other part of the machine Right here, there is also a mechanical arm that makes a fire step. Eh? And this uh, is a stamp that uh, uh, has the main indication about the beginning of the working process. But the other side of the machine leaves the crystals of uh, salt on top. But uh, it's very important that the salt must be better distributed in every corner of uh, the leg uh, by hand. Like there are some employers at the end that uh, usually they uh, concentrate more the salt around the central bowl of the leg. And after this, uh, they keep immediately inside one of these fridges uh, for one week. Eh? Passing vats of salt and exploring huge fridges full of prosciutto at their various stages of aging, we learn that prosciutto di Parma is made by carefully selecting the finest pork legs. The meat is salted and left to rest before undergoing a long aging process in special environments. Giacomo explains that this technique gradually develops a distinctive flavour, aroma and tender texture, resulting in the iconic cured ham we know and love. 
one is in the middle, eh, you can see like a depression, another one near Anchetta, eh, uh, this fragment of bone, another one near the central bone, another one uh, approximately here in which you have the main vein of the leg and the last one near the other border. So if in the five critical points the smell is good, you can proceed and you can uh, make uh, the fire stamp. If the smell is not so good, uh, it's a big problem. Uh, usually it's not possible to sell, it's not possible to eat, uh, but it's very rare. Uh, uh. The tour culminates with the tasting of prosciutto crudo di Parma and other cured meats, including culata, the most tender part of the boneless thigh. After working up an appetite, we head back towards Castello di Torre Chiara and pick a little restaurant in the centre of town for lunch. The warm sun bounces off the colourful buildings of green, yellow and orange that line the piazza. Sitting in the shade under thick vines, I order the asparagus lasagna. The delicate flavour of the tender asparagus is separated with layers of rich and creamy bechamel sauce, creating a delightful contrast. I savour every bite, not wanting it to end. Lasagna is more than just a meal, it's a family institution and each family's unique recipe becomes a valued legacy handed down through the generations. These layers of pasta and sauce are like a comforting embrace for your taste buds, evoking warm memories. Whether you prefer it blanketed in rich ragu and bechamel or adorned with a delicate white sauce, one crucial principle remains. The pasta should be as light as a feather and rolled with love. The authentic Bolognese lasagna is made with spinach-based pasta. The most famous lasagnas in Italy and the world have their epicenter in Bologna. Though its modern form emerged during the Renaissance, a friendly rivalry between Bologna and Naples persists over its true origin. Despite this dispute, one thing is clear, Bologna is the beating heart of lasagna. In the afternoon we arrive in Parma, where we stay in a beautiful hotel located in Piazza del Duomo. My king-size room has a kitchen, two armchairs, a huge desk, TV and two double windows that overlook the thousand-year-old Parma Cathedral and Baptistry. With some free time to spare, I go and explore Parma. I visit the cathedral and baptistry before making a beeline for Palazzo della Pilotta. Teatro Farnese, a remarkable wooden structure and one of the oldest surviving examples of Renaissance theatre. Also here is the Galleria Nazionale di Parma or Art Gallery of Parma, which is home to the famous painting by Leonardo da Vinci, La Scapigliata. In the late afternoon, Giacomo joins us again for what will end up being part one of two walking tours with him in the centre of Parma. His passion and knowledge for his hometown is infectious as he takes us to a local shop serving a wildly popular pastry that's only available in this shop. We continue exploring the centre until just before sunset where we're led to a historic 17th century building for dinner which was restored in the 18th century by the Count's Sacco. Wearing an apron and chef's hat covered in ladybugs, the head chef greets us and explains that everything is made to order. Nothing here is pre-prepared. This is the epitome of slow food cuisine. For our last dinner together, we start with frittata and porcini mushrooms on a bed of prosciutto crudo di parma and parmigiana di melanzane or eggplant with parmigiano reggiano and tortellini for our main. For dessert, I keep things simple with the serving of shaved pineapple. With a heavy heart, it's time to say goodbye to Parma as our Emilia Romagna food tour comes to an end. But before we say goodbye, we have another full day of excitement. After a serving of scrumptious eggs on toast for breakfast, Giacomo comes to collect us for part two of our Parma walking tour. 
We explore Gyaya Market, the city's largest covered market, see an old Roman bridge, and visit a small church with the stunning art installation of over 200,000 flowers, which symbolically represent the citizens of Parma. Giacomo then surprises us with the visit to the Fondazione Museo Glauco Lombardi, where we learn about the life of Napoleon's wife, Maria Louise, the Duchess of Parma. Interestingly, her coat of arms is part of the logo of the luxury brand Acqua di Parma. Its use pays homage to the Duchess's rule and the help that she provided in the development of the perfume and the glass industry in Parma. Continuing our theme of perfume, we visit an old pharmacy dating from 1652, which provided free medicines exclusively to the sick and needy of Parma. It's here we take part in a perfume workshop, where we learn how to produce our very own fragrance. After mixing a variety of scents for the perfect aroma, I'm pretty happy with my three citrus-based scents. For our final meal together and with Parma behind us, we head back into the countryside for lunch at a winery with a stunning view of Castello di Torre Chiara. As we sip Malvasia wine, we enjoy our final feast together, savouring every last bite. Allora, eccoci qui. So there you have it. This is how I've experienced the beautiful Emilia Romagna region with the Untold Italy Beyond Bologna tour. There are so many exclusive tours and experiences that you won't be able to do any other way. So I definitely recommend checking out their tours, especially this one, using the link in the description below this video. Before you visit Italy, make sure you brush up on your Italian skills with my travel-focused online video courses that use my unique 80-20 method. You'll be able to interact with the locals and avoid being treated like a tourist. For more details, visit intrepidItalian.com or click on the link in the description below this video. In the meantime, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel and turn on those notifications so you get an alert when I post more videos like this one. Until next time, thanks for watching and buon viaggio and buon appetito. Ciao for now.